Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Okay, um, once a year, and it's usually at the uh, February <coughs> Council meeting, uh, Terry Manolio gives a report on the activities of the Genomic Medicine Working Group. And take it away, Terry. Great. Actually, we, uh, we have tended to do these at the September Council meeting, but last September Council was jam-packed, so we thought we would postpone a bit. Um, so uh, just to remind you, there, there are several working groups of this council. One of them is on genomic medicine, and we established this one shortly after um, the strategic plan was released uh, in February of 2011, to, to basically to advise us and assist us in uh, um, uh, identifying the research needed to evaluate and implement this field, including reviewing, reviewing current progress, identifying key advances, uh, planning meetings, facilitating collaborations, and then um, looking at as we identified needs, how do we then build the long-term infrastructure for those uh, to fill those. Uh, this is the, the current um, uh, makeup of the working group. You'll notice several um, past council members as well as two current ones, uh, Howard Jacob and Dan Roden, and I'll, I'll call on you after I'm finished. And, to correct any of the mistakes that I, uh, that I made in this. So you have to pay attention, Dan, yeah, sorry. So um, one of the things that we do, one of our key activities, is to lead a series of genomic medicine meetings. We started this in June of 2011, and I won't go through all of them. Um, well, I'll go through all of them, but not, not in any detail. Uh, we subsequently published a paper on, on this one um, in uh, genetics and medicine. Uh, the second one was on uh, forming collaborations. This is the, the uh, duke Mitri project, which uh, subsequently uh, went into a, a large-scale collaboration. Um, the third one was on stakeholders. The fourth on physician education. Out of that grew the uh, Inter-Society Coordinating Committee that Eric mentioned earlier, and I'll talk about uh, a little bit. Um, we had a, a fifth one on federal strategies that, uh, that actually is becoming quite useful now that we're looking at the Precision Medicine Initiative and the impetus from the White House. Our sixth one um, on sort of global efforts in implementing genomic medicine, I actually reported to you on uh, back last February, so I'll, I'll only touch on this one. Um, but that one occurred since our, our last report to you, as well as the seventh um, in October on genomic clinical decision support. And we have an eighth coming up in June uh, where the, the working group said, you know, we've, we've been at this about four years now. Let's take a step back and kind of look at the, the entire portfolio and see you know, what, uh, wh where we are and, and where we'd like to go. Um, so the, the sixth meeting, as I mentioned, I, I described to you uh, back about a year ago, um, looking to engage international agencies, explore activities, identify how we might be able to collaborate. One of the neat things about this was that it included parts of the world that we haven't typically had involved in, in many of these discussions, um, and so we were very happy to have them there. And just a, a couple of kind of nifty projects that we heard about there, one in Singapore, which is doing uh, testing for stromal corneal dystrophies, which are opacities that occur in the cornea um, that are, are heavily determined by just a few genes, one of them being uh, TGF-beta-induced protein, or TGF-BI. Um, one of the, the actionable aspects of this is that people who have this condition or who are prone to it should not undergo LASIK therapy, uh, keratoplasty, because it can recur or actually accelerate um, in the uh, uh, in the operated eye. So, so this is worth knowing, and, and they are implementing screening of family members because these variants tend to be uh, common in Singapore. Um, <clears throat> there's also an Estonian program uh, that actually was just approved back in, in December, then the next phase of that I had, had previously reported to you on, on uh, uh, the, the plans for uh, developing an, an Estonian, uh, Estonian array. Uh, but uh, now they have a pilot project for actual implementation using their e exceedingly well-connected um, uh, electronic medical record system. Actually, they have kind of an, an electronic health system throughout the country, which is fabulous. So that one is moving forward as well. Um, and we also talked a little bit about uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome and some screening efforts and prevention efforts going on in Thailand. Um, this is a particular problem there because of the, the high frequency of the, uh, the risk alleles to, that have been identified to date in that part of the world, as well as a high frequency of the use of, of several of the drugs that lead to this. Um, so, so it's an important uh, topic there. And what they described to us was what they call a pharmacogenomics card, which is, is really just a like a credit card um, that they give patients who have been screened that includes their, their name, the outcome of the assay, the date, um, the interpretation. And the interpretation for this patient is that they have a high risk of, of developing Stevens-Johnson, which is a, an exfoliating skin condition. It's an absolutely horrible thing. It's like having a third degree burn across your entire skin surface, surface and, and actually uh, internally as well, and a very high mortality rate. 
Uh, and then on ba the back of this card, as you can see, there are suggestions and uh, con contact information uh, and that for, um, uh, uh, for practitioners. <clears throat> One of the interesting things about this is while this has been very effective in dealing with an individual patient and clinician, patients go to many different clinicians, and so there actually is a recurrence risk in, in Thailand and other countries of people who, amazingly enough, have had Stevens-Johnson and still are, are re-prescribed the, uh, uh, the causative agents and develop it again. There are also cases where people have been appropriately screened and um, uh, their doctor is notified, but some other doctor is not notified, and, and that uh, doctor prescribes the drug, and there have been deaths from that. And so one of the things that we're discussing is, is there a way to implement some kind of an electronic system where uh, if you were to be prescribed one of these drugs anywhere in the country, there would be a quick lookup um, in a database that says, no, 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 this person should never get this. And, and obviously there are a lot of policy issues that have to be addressed in that, but, but wouldn't that be a, a nice thing to have? Um, recognizing that, that this uh, idea of a pharmacogenetics card in particular sort of resonated with a lot of the, the uh, uh, attendees at our meeting, um, we kind of asked, well, gee, is there some way that we could make this sort of a signature project and get a number of countries, particularly those in Southeast Asia, but not only there, um, to, to try to implement this? Um, and we, so we kind of came back, uh, looked around at NIH, and there are very, very few uh, grants funded in this area. There are like two um, that we are aware of. And so in talking with various uh, uh, sister institutes, about 10 of them, uh, we agreed that it would be worthwhile to have a workshop that basically looked at, at the state of research in, in this area and what uh, NIH might or, or could do. Um, so we have a meeting coming up uh, uh, early next month to rever review the current state of knowledge, uh, examine the role of genomics and pharmacogenetics in, in uh, etiology treatment and potentially eradic eradication of the preventable causes of this, which most, most of which are genetic, um, and then identify uh, gaps in unmet, unmet needs. Uh, this is the planning committee, and you'll note there are, are uh, several from our sister agency, the FDA, uh, who also are, are obviously very interested in, in this area. Uh, and the group that came together for the global leaders meeting wanted to continue um, to, to develop other areas of collaboration. And so we kind of uh, spun off from this something we've called the Global, um, global Genomic Medicine Collaborative. G2MC, Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative, yes, um, that is in, in partnership with the Institute of Medicine. Uh, and and that's, that group is, is continuing on. You'll note some, some uh, uh, well-known faces here as well. Um, and one of the things we recognize is that there are other global groups in genomics, particularly the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, uh, GA4GH, and they have several uh, uh, similar working groups and, and areas of, of emphasis, although they have been primarily focused on research and database generation where um, uh, the uh, uh, genomic medicine collaboration um, is focusing much more on um, uh, implementation in, in clinical care. And so it made sense to us to, to really try to get these two groups working together, and we have sort of joint uh, shared people on working groups, so I'm on some of theirs. We have other NHGRI staff on, on the GA4GH, um, and, and similarly, uh, Peter Goodhand sits on, on uh, one or two of ours as well. So, so we are working to make that happen. It never happens as, as easily as you'd like it to, but uh, we're hoping that we can have that occur. And as I mentioned, the, the goals of this collaborative uh, are really to serve as sort of a nexus or clearinghouse for genomic medicine implementation activities globally, uh, develop opportunities for some demonstration projects like the PGX card that I mentioned, um, maybe capture and disseminate some best practices, and, and uh, develop a financial model for sustaining these efforts. Uh, there is a lot of interest among various governments to actually um, uh, pursuing this kind of work. Eric mentioned uh, earlier the Intersociety Coordinating Committee that Bob Wilden is, has now taken on. Uh, that grew out of our fourth genomic medicine meeting, um, something that is that uh, we'll be continuing to shepherd uh, kind of through the, the genomic medicine working group and through me. Uh, I'm sorry, this is just a screenshot of the, the genomics and genetics competency center, the G2C2 resource where we put a lot of the uh, educational products developed, and, and our colleague Gene Jenkins uh, has been leading this admirably for the past about two years. Uh, Eric mentioned the training residents in genomics or TRIG model that we learned about from uh, a pathology colleague, Rich Haspel at Beth Israel Deaconess. Um, and they use uh, what they call a structured approach to learning based on, on sound uh, curriculum development I ideas, uh, such as in, in this uh, uh, sort of landmark resource. Um, they, they have done uh, needs assessments for this. Uh, they're looking at strategies for, and um, uh, objectives for teaching based on their sort of knowledge-based, performance-based, and effective, and I'll describe what those are. Um, and then an evaluation and some dissemination uh, research as well. 
So the needs assessment was, uh, was actually uh, done a little bit earlier before they got started in this proje project, and this is funded by NCI through a, a grant through NCI. Um, and recognize that really the millennial learner is quite different from the way that, that I and many others uh, learn in medical school. Um, uh, people in this generation don't go to class. We didn't go to class much, but apparently they don't go at all. Um, and uh, and they, they really, they prefer to, to sit and, and listen to lectures at home on their iPads or, or whatever, um, and then come in uh, essentially to have discussions. And, and so um, um, this has been referred to as a flipped classroom, where you send out the, the lectures, have people watch them, and then they come in uh, for a discussion section that's more performance-based. And one of the things that's, that's really neat about this, this curriculum is that there are a series of exercises where basically they're given uh, genetic information on, in this example, breast cancer, BRCA1 variants in, in a given patient. And okay, here's, you know, here are the variants that this person has, how do you interpret these? And then they, they're asked to link to various databases to, to learn how to do that, how to interpret them. That's kind of the first lesson. The second lesson is a gene panel, something like the mammoprint or oncoprint uh, or oncotype DX. The third is a whole exome. The fourth is a whole genome. And each time they're, they're asked to uh, query appropriate databases and interpret them and, and give advice to a patient. These are done in teams. Uh, they've actually done this as a, as a curic curriculum for residents as well as at meetings. They'll do like an eight-hour session with you know, two hours on each of those. Uh, very effective and, and very well received by, uh, by those who've been involved. And I, one of the neat things about this is that the entire curriculum, all the teaching materials, and, and everything really is, is available on the uh, American Society for Clinical Pathology website. Um, and uh, if one, one goes to their website, you can download uh, their materials and, and use them, sort of uh, uh, customize them, as it were. Um, and Rich has published a, a nice paper on this in the American Journal of Clinical Pathology. Uh, when we heard about this, there were several other societies. Remember, the ISCC is actually a group of professional organizations, and the neurologists and the cardiologists and others sort of said, we could do that for our area, um, and we're putting together a group now to do just that and, and try, to, try to develop modules that could be used by, by uh, uh, larger numbers of people. Uh, the seventh um, meeting that I mentioned to you was held in October. It was on genomic clinical decision support, clinical decision support being that, those little annoying reminders that pop up um, for clinicians that say, uh, has your patient had their pneumovax, or it, it seems as though they haven't had their colonoscopy, is there a reason why, or whatever. Um, and, and clinical decision support is a challenge because you have to be careful not to do too much of it, or people get tired and they start clicking through the alerts and, and ignoring them. It's called alert fatigue. Uh, you also have to balance off the desires of various institutional um, uh, councils and, and others who, who basically want everything alerted so that they've told the doctors um, what, what it is that they need to do, and if the doctors don't do it, that's kind of their problem. Obviously, you need to balance those off so that you're not overwhelming people with this kind of information. Uh, but for genomics, the clinical decision support probably is, is A, essential because the genomic information is so vast, um, and B, really can be tailored in, in a way, you know, this really is personalized medicine. And so, so there are very few people who carry variants that put them at risk for Stevens-Johnson syndrome. But boy, when you have one, you want to know it. And so, so you want to be sure that the CDS only fires when you need it. Uh, when, so it's not only that that person has the variant, but they're about to be prescribed one of these drugs. At any rate, we had a, a meeting to discuss this. Uh, what would be the ideal state? What are the gaps? Um, you know, how can we engage uh, ongoing health IT initiatives such as the Office of the National Coordinator, and then to define a prioritized research agenda, recognizing that there's a group at the Institute of Medicine that is also working very actively on genomic clinical decision support, as well as in the Office of the National Coordinator. Uh, and these were, were some uh, potential collaborative projects that, whoops, that were identified, um, uh, developing some use cases, sort of putting together a, a sandbox where people can kind of go and play with these use cases and various tools and, and see how they can make them better. Um, a knowledge library, uh, hopefully some kind of an end-to-end -end project that, that begins with the, the, the evidence and then moves toward, forward to implementation. And, uh, and a considerable emphasis on the role of the patient uh, as well as the caregiver, uh, somewhat as, as was described um, for the, um, uh, the ClinGen project and that Genome Connect website that, uh, that involves patients. The eighth program, uh, as I mentioned, is going to be in June, and this is to review our portfolio, again, look at gaps and opportunities for collaboration. 
Uh, obviously, the Precision Medicine Initiative will be probably a little bit better um, uh, formulated by June and certainly will be the, the uh, uh, topic of, of several of those discussions as well. Um, we'd like to engage other NIHICs and other funders in, in areas that they might be working that we could leverage some of their efforts um, <clears throat> and look at, uh, at uh, research needs for NHGRI and other agencies to pursue uh, and maybe also look at ways to uh, capture and disseminate best practices. And then to, to address questions that have come up in this council, you know, how do we measure really or assess the impact of these programs? So, so what are good metrics? What are things that are convincing? Um, and what are things that are measurable? Because, because they, they can be quite difficult to measure. Uh, we're anticipating probably doing a, a ninth meeting. We do these about once every six to nine months or so. Um, and uh, Howard, Jacob and I have, have spoken briefly about the potential for, for some kind of a meeting focusing on, on how, one, uh, how uh, clinical laboratories decide what variants should be reported as, as kind of secondary findings. It's not kind of the ethics of doing that, but just what criteria do you have and, and you know, what kind of quality criteria do you need as well as evidence and, and other things. So, so stay tuned. We'll be, we'll be working on developing that. So with that, I'd like to, uh, to thank everyone who's involved in, in putting together these programs, um, particularly our, our, our GMWG. And, uh, and with that, I'll turn to, let's see, Dr. Rodin, would you like to start? You wouldn't like to start. I think the, the programs that, that you've put in place are the kinds of things that, you know, the Precision Medicine Initiative is going to require. And, and I, you know, and, and so, um, you know, one of the questions that I have when I think about what, what the Genomic Medicine Working Group has done is sort of how are those efforts going to be leveraged to sort of expand the, the scope by an order of magnitude or two. Uh, you know, we all, we're all running on limited bandwidth, but it looks like we're going to actually have to run on even more limited bandwidth. And that's a good thing. I mean, I, you know, if, if, if the efforts of this institute have been to to not only sequence the genomes, geno the genome and the genomes, but to actually figure out what that means for human health, then, then these, these, these meetings have been a, an important starting point, and they really are just a starting point. But I don't have anything more to add than that. Great. Uh, just before, is, was it directly to this point? Oh, please, go ahead. See, that pertains to the question I was going to ask. Is I sense, and maybe it's a, in the catbird seat that I rest in, is this field's about to explode yeah. and at all fronts. And my question really as a community, are we ready for it? And, you know, we've been working on that interface between practice and research, rightly so. And, and again, complimenting you that you've done a great job in facilitating those discussions. But again, what can we do as a community to get us ready for this explosion? that I sense is here? Sure. No, it's an excellent question and a, and a huge problem. I, I think, you know, one of the things we need to do is to learn from our programs what are the big barriers, what are the real stumbling blocks. Uh, just to take as a, as a simple example in eMERGE, I think we, we recognized when we first started looking at, at some of the arrhythmia genes, you know, gee, these genes are supposed, if you have variants in these, they're supposed to be, do really bad things, they can cause sudden death and that sort of thing. And then you start to look and, and see, well, gee, we had 40 people, really none of them, all, only one had a prolonged QT. Um, you know, none of them really had any evidence of, of uh, family, family history of sudden cardiac arrest or whatever. So we started asking the question, well, gee, what really is the penetrance of these things? You know, how often do you see these variants in unselected populations and, and what do they mean in terms of, of health? And that's where the, you know, sort of phase three of eMERGE, as Dan said, eMERGE kind of changes every time, you know, every, as do many of our programs, every time they're renewed. So, so the whole purpose of, of that program is to look at 25,000 people with all these variants and see if they had any phenotypic measure, you know, uh, uh, evidence at all. That's just one, uh, one example. In the IGNITE program, for example, we are recognizing that you can't, you know, the things that you can do at a Duke or University of Texas or wherever, you can't necessarily do out in a VA hospital or out in, you know, Podunk. You or whatever, um, and so so trying to figure out what works and what doesn't in smaller settings is another area. But I think one of the things we really need to do very actively is figure out, you know, what are the lessons, what are the barriers that we've run up against, and then use our programs to address those, and then hope that that will be taken up by others. I got my degree at Podunk U. But, um, <laughs> it also seems that the president's uh, national U.S. national research cohorts an opportunity here. That, yeah. that really we can 
push that interface between re research and practice even further from 25,000 to more than a million. That's a real opportunity for us. Totally agree. Uh, Howard, Jacob, do you want to comment? Yeah, so um, I think, Eric, to your point, one of the issues that we were talking about at the Undiagnosed Disease Steering Committee a couple weeks ago at Stanford, we had a face-to-face -face meeting, is that while I think there's more and more consensus towards what what information do you put together for calling a variant uh, being causal, uh, if it's in the literature, it becomes quite easy, but what types of functional information do you need to add if you don't have another patient? How do you deal with that? And then the whole secondary issue is, is becoming a major deal in that the different labs that are doing this are all making these calls, and how do we come up with strategies around making it? So I think, I think the technology of sequencing is getting really, really good, obviously, but the interpretation and how do we leverage data across sites I think is really important. So that was the discussion we were having is, is it sounds really easy, but how do we actually put some firm boundaries around what is a secondary reportable thing for a clinical purpose versus what are we used to doing in research? And I think these lines are, are they seem concrete, but as you really get in and start looking at it, they're really quite blurry. And so I think these looking at these areas are incredibly important. Carol. So uh, re regarding secondary findings, so the American College um, of um, Medical Genetics and Genomics did publish a, a list. I mean, is, is that a good starting point oh, for this discussion? Or? Absolutely. And the SCN5A uh, gene that we, that we mentioned, you know, a couple of councils ago is on that list. And it's, it's one of the most devastating because it's associated with sudden, sudden cardiac death. So, so that's a good place to start. But even there, you have penetrance and other issues. Howard, did you want to? Yeah, and there's not wide agreement on that. Um, there's a tremendous variability around how people are using those guidelines and where to go forward on that. So there's a lot to be done around that. So I think it's a great discussion point, but it's a long way away from how people are going to practice medicine with it and how we're going to use it. So. so Carlos, could we let Jim comment on that? Yeah. I, I was just going to say that, you know, the NHGRI is, of course, sponsoring the ClinGen program, and one of the whole points of it is to, is to figure out um, actionability, how to aggregate adjudications of variants, et cetera. So, so there is a large, large effort that's, that's going on with that. So. I was going to mention, like my ClinGen colleague, that this is one of the things that ClinGen's taking on. Um, the, the thing that really worries me is as we move forward and NIH is paying for less and less of genome sequencing, the incentives to share data have to be made really explicit, right? You know, as I say to people, did you read that paper on a million MRIs that was in Nature last week? No, you didn't, because they didn't write it, because people don't share MRI data, and that's, <laughs> you know, but that's what we risk being the de facto state, right? There's nothing about genomic data that makes it more shareable than other kinds of data, except that, you know, the NIH has used its carrots and sticks to say, if you want to get a grant, you got to share your genetic data, and that's why the field has had this sort of culture of sharing. Um, and so when we think about the Global Alliance projects and beacons and, you know, all the security concerns, um, we, we really need to think very hard about the incentive structure to really, you know, allow the data to be shared or else we're, it's going to be a, you know, a, a big problem, right? And I think, Bob, um, last time you mentioned that the ACMG had, um, you know, put in their sort of code of ethics that if you run a lab, uh, sorry, the what? ABMG. ABMG, okay. Um, that if you run a lab, you're sort of obligated to, to share data. And I think, you know, ClinGen's doing some of that at the variant level. We want to start doing that at the individual level. But um, it really is, I think, going to be one of the biggest bottlenecks um, to our being able to aggregate this kind of data. No, that, that's an excellent point. If I could just follow up, and then I'll call on Bob. And, and um, you, you may remember in Eric's slides on the Precision Medicine Initiative, one of the things he said was going to be very different about this is the involvement of participants. And, and one of the things we're really anticipating is we will have participants who want their data out there, and, and we will have them actively engaged. And then we get, you know, we, we can deal with a lot of the consent issues. So just to this point, Lucille? Yeah, uh, because sometimes it will. will it's not only the participants wanting, the institutions that hold the rest of the data need to participate in some form. Yeah. So I think that, that's important. The other minor thing, I just had a protest about clinical decision support and not, it's just not the, the annoying 
pop-ups that show up. There's more to it, but that's the manifestation of a, of a sometimes bad implemented bad, yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. So Bob and then Artie. So I just wanted to make two comments. One is about the educational issues. So um, I, I think there are different le levels on which this can happen. I, I put together something similar to this for our UCSF um, medical school curriculum. In fact, we just had it last week where I had a bunch of students go through variants and go through databases and figure out what's going on. And it was a very good flipped classroom s situation. And a couple of pathologists that I know actually took my stuff and used it for their teaching. And I'm thinking this, what these guys have done is an order of magnitude better than what I did, this ASCP mm -hmm. thing. So um, I'm assuming that AMP as well as the um, the Association of Professors of Medical and Human Genetics know about these curricula and that we can sort of start getting it infiltrating into both student and resident education. Right, so, so both AMP and the APHMG and many other CAP and, and yeah. others are members of this Inter Society Coordinating Committee. How, you know, the messages get from their representatives to their leadership, but yeah. we just try to keep repeating it as much as we okay. can. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll work on AMP. because um, That would be great. I'm sort of getting involved with them. The other issue about the sharing of data, uh, you know, I, I think these volunteer efforts, and, and I'm a member of the, the ClinGen Consortium and also the Global Alliance, I think they're all really terrific. But fundamentally, I think that CMS and the FDA are going to have to make sharing data a requirement to provide clinical services, period. I think it's got to be regulation. Thanks. And you'll have the opportunity to share, share some of those thoughts soon. Yes, Artie. So I, I feel an obligation to, to plug an Institute of Medicine report that came out a few weeks ago on sharing of clinical trial data. I was on the, the committee that wrote that report, and uh, one funny comment, one serious comment. The funny comment is that, uh, everyone else on the committee was a clinical trialist of, of some sort, and I said, oh, well, the genomicists have been doing this for years now. Why can't you guys just do it? And they were like, oh, the genomicists are very different, you know. <laughs> and so I thought, <laughs> and, um, but in, more seriously, the report does have a range of um, uh, different policy options that everyone sh who is interested in the question of sharing, particularly clinical trial data, should consider. I will agree with Bob that that um, it's without some sort of regulatory um, hammer, though, such as what EMA is doing, the European Medicines Agency. You know, I suspect um, it'll be much more of a challenge than um, than we um, would hope it would be. Um, additionally, um, I, I do think that um, the report itself does not call for FDA regulation. I think that it would have to be something that Congress would 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 be have to become interested in. But I don't. I think that that is something that should be on Congress's agenda at some point. Great points. Anything else? No? I think that'll do it. Somehow I don't think Eric's going to need it. No, probably not. Yeah, it's just, just Jackie. Okay. Uh, now, this came out of uh, uh, Eric's uh, presentation, came out of a, a request from Council to get a report or an update on the Alzheimer's disease sequencing project. And are, is this our NIA contingent over here? This is Marilyn Miller is a program director at uh, NIA and has been taking the lead on the Alzheimer's program. And uh, Dr. Schellenberg is from the University of Pennsylvania. And Dr. Mayu, uh, Mar Mayu, sorry. Oh, oh, so is Dr. Mayu not with us? Okay. He didn't die. <laughs> He's still with us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they're available uh, for the discussion part of this. So, uh, Eric, take us away. 